We have, a, we have an excellent presentation today, guys. So settle in, uh, get your lunches open, and, and get ready for quite a show. So uh, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Jacobson here um, join us today. He got his medical degree at Cornell University, and he did his residency in the IM as well as fellowship in infectious disease at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. His focus of research is immunology and the immunopathogenesis of HIV infection. He has chaired numerous clinical research studies, including the Immunology Committee and the Steering Committee of the ACTG. He has co-chaired the Long-Acting Drug Task Force in the ACTG and currently chairs the Microbiome Focus Group, as well as the Therapeutic Vaccination Focus Group. Um, uh, currently, he chairs the ACTG A5369 HIV gag conserved element DNA vaccine, which serves as a therapeutic vaccination for HIV-infected persons with viral suppression on antiretroviral therapy. And today, he'll be discussing long-acting HIV therapies. Well, thank you for that. All right. So... This is mustache, but this is a um, he heaping ulcerative lesion that is obstructing both nares. Uh, medical residents, any thoughts of what this is? Okay, we move up to fellows. <laughs> Well, it's possible. Herpes simplex, which one? Uh, this would be the head is just deep down, so I would start with a cyclic like Okay, so this, so uh, with the, sorry, with, 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 with new, uh, with the new uh, techniques available to the microbiology lab that allowed one to grow viruses, at least that time, this grew out herpes simplex virus 2, um, which um, was treated with an investigational drug that was available uh, by uh, compassionate release named acyclovir and healed, but the patient went on to continue to deteriorate, developed numerous other infections, and disseminated Kaposi sarcoma, and died in about a year's time, 22 years old. So this turned out to be, I saw this patient and treated this patient when I was a first year fellow and I apologize for the black and white photo, but that sort of tells you the date. Um, um, when I was a first-year fellow at Mount Sinai Hospital in New, in New York, and this turned out to be one of the first reported cases of what uh, eventually be became, uh, was, was called the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. This, you don't see herpes occur like this in an immune competent host. So we came a long way from there. And, uh, and now with whatever regimen you, that's recommended that you can, uh, that you use on in patients when they first come in, over 90% of individuals are gonna get sustained uh, suppression of their, uh, of their virus and, and live essentially normal lives. Yet if you ask patients, and here's a survey of two major uh, uh, HIV care programs, um, over 400 responders, um, and if you ask them would they be interested in long-acting injectable antiretrovirals instead, um, over 80% said either definitely or probably they would be interested. Uh, they'd be more interested if it was once a month, but even once a week there was interest. It cut across all age groups, all races and genders, included people who were having trouble taking their oral agents. And what reasons do they cite? Well, the main one has been convenience. Others are the sense of privacy, 
of avoiding stigma, of someone discovering that they're taking HIV medicines either at home or work. Um, they, they cite pill fatigue. You know, these are people who are essentially healthy now and uh, having to remember to take their medicines every day. And uh, another factor is, and I think this is the most important use of these agents, is in people who are just not succeeding on oral therapy. And we all, all of us who take care of HIV-infected patients have this group of people who just, for whatever reason, are just not succeeding like they should be biologically. Um, and whatever psychosocial issues there are, drug use is, can be a factor. And we know that adolescents uh, notoriously are, are, have, have poor adherence to medications. Um, and I think, you know, in this day where there's a major program on to try to end the HIV epidemic or at least control it to, to its insignificance, um, getting patients who are not succeeding on oral therapy um, successfully treated for their own sake and so they don't spread it to others in the community, I think would be extremely important. And I think this is where these agents are, are potentially more, most useful. In, in the contraception world, I don't know where this point. In the contraception world, um, we know that long-acting reversible contraceptives, um, whether deep, uh, whether uh, um, uh, depot device and, and depot um, uh, Provera, these kind of uh, devices, either subcutaneously or intrauterinely, have much lower rates of contraception failure than uh, oral contraceptives. Similarly, in the schizophrenia world where adherence is a, a, a major um, issue, um, a, 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 an agent that's uh, formulated in a way similar to what we're going to be talking about with HIV drugs has lower uh, failure rates, uh, relapse rates of schizophrenia than, uh, than a comparable oral agent in this uh, randomized control study. Um, how are these agents deliver? Well, delivered, they can be injected, uh, they can be given intravenously, particularly the, the uh, antibodies, although um, there can be uh, injectable formulations of these as well. Um, there could be implants, or there's even oral ways of delivering these long-acting formulations. What are the issues to address with injectables? Well, the main one is adverse events. Um, Almost universally, they get injection site reactions because the volume is very large and the way the formulations that these, the, the drugs are put in um, just are more irritating and cause uh, more reactions at the site. But you know, the big concern is you give an in, you give an injectable; it's there for you know a, could be as long as a year. There's detectable levels. What happens if someone develops an adverse event? Uh, on it, you're sort of stuck with having the drug there indefinitely. And so many uh, companies have, uh, that are involved in this have developed so-called oral lead-ins where you give the drug orally for a little while, show that the patient can tolerate it well without an adverse events, and then switch to the injectable. Now, th but, you know, if you think about it, this requires a company developing two formulations to get one effect that doubles the work in terms of uh, all the resources that would be needed, all, all the clinical testing that would be needed, and all the regulatory work that would have to be done. So this is not a simple solution. And the FDA, and it, you can't, there's no oral equivalent to an antibody. So the FDA, FDA actually doesn't require this, but it, it is done with some of the formulations we'll talk about. Um, there's the issue of drug-drug interactions that you always have to be aware of. Knowing that someone is on a long-acting agent that's there for a long period of time, you have to be careful about what else you're administering to the patient for other reasons, knowing that there might be drug interactions with that drug. Then there's the issue of the tail. Um, when so, when if a patient stops taking it or you decide to take the patient off it, that drug's going to be around for a while. How do you cover all these issues related to drug interactions, uh, adverse events, and uh, the issue of drug resistance, because we in infectious disease know that the best formula for developing resistance to a drug is to expose that the infectious agent 
to uh, sub-therapeutic levels of a drug. So as it's tailing off, it's a recipe for developing resistance to that drug and perhaps that whole class of drugs. So management of drug resistance, either in a tail or even before a while, and, this is, and drug resistance has occurred in some of the studies in people even getting uh, the regular regimen, even before they're stopped. Um, so management of resistance is important. Management of pregnancy is important, or, or um, being sure that what you're giving is safe for pregnancy um, in people who are possibly going to become pregnant. Uh, as I mentioned, the volumes are, is a big issue. And, you know, you may have more than one agent that you're using that may have different pharmacokinetics, so coordinating when to give injections um, and the, the dosing schedule is, is, is an issue to be addressed. What are the drugs? Well, um, cabotegravir is an uh, integrase inhibitor that um, has been made, in, milled into a nanoparticle suspension. Um, and when, when done and given by injection, you can see there's, this, this is a timeline measured in weeks. You see there's prolonged exposure to, to effective concentrations of this drug because when injected, it's, the, the nanoparticle suspension slowly diffuse and distribute through the body. Similarly, rapivirine, which is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, in this study given every eight weeks, maintained uh, uh, persistent effective levels uh, with that uh, drug regimen, with that dosing interval in this study. Uh, studied for effectiveness in first in LATTE2, um, these two agents given together in patients, the, the idea was to study them for maintenance of, of viral suppression after getting them suppressed. And so initially, these patients were treated with oral cabotegravir, the oral equivalent of the lead-in, um, plus lamivudine abacavir, and became suppressed, and then they were randomized to either continuing that oral regimen or being switched to either monthly uh, combination of the two or every two months with slightly higher doses uh, of the two drugs. And you can see that the suppression rate was equivalent. There was non-inferiority. That allowed it to move on to the phase three studies, which uh, were completed recently. This is 48-week data where patients uh, initially suppressed on their current antiretroviral regimen in ATLAS, were then randomized to the, the two injectables versus continuing the oral regimen, and the uh, maintenance of suppression rate was non-inferior. Same thing in FLARE, which uh, had a specific regimen that people were suppressed on, uh, diotegravir, bacavir, 3TC, and then randomized to either continuing that oral regimen or getting the two injectables. And again, the suppression rate over 48 weeks was equivalent, non-inferior. Injection site reactions, as I mentioned earlier, are almost universal, particularly pain. Uh, almost 100% of people will develop that. But these are, were judged to be mild, grade ones or twos, and most of them resolved within a week. Are patients satisfied being on these studies and getting these injections? Um, you can see on a scale of one to six, almost everyone is a five or a six. Um, very highly satisfied patients. Now you can argue that these are patients who are predisposed to liking it because they wanted to be on the study, but nonetheless, after being on the study, they remained happy with it. I should point out at this point that in December, Application for approval of this combination for the maintenance of suppression in people with HIV was presented to the FDA, but the FDA rejected their application for approval. Um, not, it's not publicly known why they objected it, but a statement released from the companies said that it wasn't based on the clinical data I've just shown. It was when you, when companies uh, apply for approval to be out there, um, they also have to submit what's called a CMC, Chemistry Manufacturing Control uh, Package of Information. 
and it was, according to the companies, it was something related to what was submitted there that was unsatisfactory to the FDA. And the FDA, at least at the moment, has rejected their application. I think people in the academic world, this is not public knowledge, so people in the academic world are not aware if there's issues that we should be more concerned of except for that particular uh, application and whether it applies more broadly. So just so that information is out there, I don't have an answer for uh, why the FDA ruled that way. But nonetheless, um, other compounds are being developed um, uh, in the same nanoparticle suspension formulation. And one is uh, a new capsid inhibitor. This is a new class of drugs that are being developed. Um, it interferes with the HIV replication cycle at the point of disassembly of the capsid as it enters the cell and then reassembly of the new virion uh, creating its new capsid going out. So it interferes at both steps. Um, and has activity, antiviral activity at least in vitro, and um, is being, and, and you can see in the nanoparticle suspension, it has also very prolonged uh, clearance rates and, and levels stay up there, allowing for uh, several months before you need to give the next injection. Um, and this is currently in early clinical trials. Um, there are multiple other drugs that are being uh, evaluated both in this formulation and others, um, but I don't have time to go through all of them. So I'll just move on to the fact that not every drug can be put into nanoparticle suspension. Um, for one thing, they need to be relatively lipophilic rather than hydrophilic, and there are other sort of characteristics that they have to have. So an alternative then is to create implants, and here's tenofovir, which is which is more hydrophilic, where uh, this, this implant device, sort of the size of the, the contraceptive devices that you could put intradermally, about 40 millimeters, um, and the tenofovir is, inside, is, is in this core surrounded by a silicone scaffold which has multiple channels where the tenofovir can uh, loot out. Um, and and this is all surrounded by a polyvinyl alcohol polymer membrane. And based on the characteristics of the polymer and, this, and the number and size of these holes, you can um, alter the diffusion rate and, 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 and get what, basically what you're interested in pharmacokinetically. And this particular product has been studied in animals and implanted, you can see persistent levels in the plasma and in intracellularly when uh, given, when put in there. Now the advantage of an implant is that you can take it out if there's adverse events. So that's uh, a positive for this approach. Now there's another drug called EFDA, which is a new nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor which is being developed, which in and of itself, when given as a pill, actually has pharmacokinetics so that it only has to be administered once a week. Um, but it has been, an implant of, of EFDA has, has been created, which has taken a different approach. In this approach, the polymers are sort of mixed homogeneously with the drug. And then and you can, based on the characteristics of the polymer that you put, put in and the drug, you can sort of alter the pharmacokinetics to your desire. And here's a study in animals that show you get you get persistent levels with this implant compared to the weekly dosing, uh, and you get what you want. Now, another approach that's being taken is to put polymers in, into a microneedle patch and put on the skin or, or even the eye, and you get, by this approach, the polymers will direct um, more a deeper penetration through the skin, and, in, in, and which will then diffuse into the rest of the body, and you, you can get persistent the levels of the, what you want this way too. So microneedle skin patches are also being studied for delivering um, uh, long-acting uh, dr uh, drug regimens. You can even, uh, there's even a group that's working on g delivering these things orally. Here's a device that um, 
you know, with multiple arms that could be that are could be folded onto each other and put into a capsule, um, eat, and then the capsule, when it's digested, uh, uh, the acid in the stomach will cause the, the arms to spring out. And in the stomach, each of the arms uh, has a polymer uh, on the outside that's structural, and then the release polymer together with the drug inside in each of the arms in this study, uh, individual HIV drugs were put, and, and you can alter the characteristics of, of this mixture in ways that each arm will elute out the drug uh, over time in the manner you're wanting to, in, that you want. And so you can deliver multiple drugs in one device that's in your stomach um, uh, and 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 uh, allows for more intermittent dosing. This is obviously early in development. This was, this was a study done in in, uh, in animals. And then there are antibodies, which is sort of what brought me into this world, because that's sort of the what what uh, I was working with uh, for a while. And it goes back to the days before antiretroviral therapy, when uh, we created. Um, uh, at Mount Sinai, a, uh, together with a blood banker, uh, an anti-HIV hyperimmune plasma. Uh, y plasma instead of gamma globulin, which uh, turns out when you go from the plasma stage to gamma globulin, you lose about 40% of antibodies. So we created this hyperimmune plasma from people who were doing well, did not have AIDS, had CD4 counts above, that were good, above 400, that had high levels of HIV antibodies, as we measured, and, gave, and created a product, treated it to kill uh, infectious agents, and gave it to people with AIDS. And back then, there was no such thing as a viral load, which is uh, basically a quantitative measurement of HIV RNA. But, but the readout, the end, clinical endpoints and studies back then was preventing new, infect, new opportunistic infections, so time to the prevention time to the development of a new optimistic infection was the readout. And you can see in this, in the, in the, in the study we, we um, published, um, there was non-significant delay in this Kaplan-Meier curve uh, with treatment compared to controls. This was a small study, so uh, you would have required a lot more numbers for significance. We also, if you looked at a curve preventing death, uh, you'd see similarly uh, this non-statistical trend towards um, delaying death. We didn't have the viral load. We didn't have quantitative HIV RNA, but we had quantitative measurements of HIV protein, P24 antigen, which is being studied at the time for the purposes of potentially being the so-called viral load. But, um, and ultimately, the RNA was a more reliable measure of that. But by quantitative HIV protein by P24 antigen, we did see a non-statistical trend towards lowering HIV uh, protein in, in these patients. We then moved on to studying uh, monoclonal antibodies against HIV that had neutralizing activity. We studied a CD4 IG, IG construct that had neutralizing, antibody, neutralizing activity against HIV and ultimately found that antibodies that um, we had most success with antibodies that interfered with um, cell entry. And if you remember, for HIV to get inside a cell, there are multiple steps. It's been roughly divided up into three, in which first it binds to CD4. The, the spike of the envelope of, of HIV binds to CD4. It then undergoes a conformational change that opens up new sites on, the end, on this spike that can then bind to a second receptor, the so-called co-receptor, which is either CCR5 or C C CXCR4. After that binding, it then undergoes another conformational change, which opens up and allows uh, uh, parts of the, the spike to pull the HIV envelope closer and to the cell envelope and then fuse. So two receptor bindings and then fusion are the steps of HIV entry into a cell. So we studied an antibody that targeted CD4, now known as ibilizumab. So this 
this antibody does not is not a competitive inhibitor of HIV binding to CD4, but it what it does is when it binds to CD4 and HIV binds there, um, it's it, HIV it, it, it's effect is conformational. HIV it, it's frozen; it cannot move to the next step. So it's an allosteric effect of that binding that prevents subsequent events of HIV entry. And for these studies, we did have the, the, what you know as the viral load. We did have quantitative HIV RNA, and when administered to patients, you do see an effect of reducing viral load. Now, this is, if, you, if you persist in treating, in this study, there were multiple doses given. Ultimately, the virus develops resistance, as it does with any drug given alone, as we'll talk about in a little bit, too. Um, a little bit earlier with ibilizumab. So wh whenever you use ibilizumab, it's important that it not be used alone, as with other drugs. Now, ibilizumab, as you know, was recently approved by the FDA for treatment of multiple drug-resistant HIV. And its approval was based on a new FDA-guided design. The FDA came up with this design with input from both the general community and the scientific community um, with, with the concept that um, it was felt, it is now felt to be unethical to expose patients like this who have limited treatment options to an arm of a study where they may not get benefit. So this design is a single um, arm study design where in the control period you sort of assess the viral load of the individuals on what they're on at the moment, and then there's a functional. Sorry, this is working. Then there is a functional monotherapy period for a week to see if the new the drug you're studying, in this case ibilizumab, has antiviral activity. It, at that point, the best background regimen on top of the new drug you're studying is added and the following six months so-called maintenance period is, is used to assess continued viral suppression and the development of adverse events over that six-month period of time. And based on that design, um, ibilizumab was found to have the desired activity in over 80% of patients, statistically significant, getting the the, the achieving a viral load drop of at least half a log, which we know from earlier studies is clinically meaningful. Clinic meaningful meaning delaying death back then. So we know that's been um, validated as a, as a clinical endpoint in people with HIV. So it was found to be effective in the 25-week period it continued to suppress most of these patients and was ultimately approved by the FDA for that. We also studied uh, an antibody against CCR5, the, the co-receptor. Um, this antibody does directly inhibit HIV uh, entry to cell um, because it binds exactly where HIV binds on the CCR5 receptor. This is the CCR5 receptor. It binds where HIV binds. The other drug that's, that's out there for treatment is Maraviroc, which binds at a different site on the CCR5 receptor because it was screened for the ability to interfere with the natural ligands binding of, at CCR5, whereas this antibody was screened based upon its ability to inhibit HIV binding. So it turns out Maraviroc works in the conformational way. It's not a direct inhibitor. It works through conformational effects, changing the conformation of the CCR5 so that it doesn't bind HIV, whereas the antibody directly inhibits. Um, and because they bind at different sites, at least in vitro, there's no cross resistance. So we, we studied PRO140 in a dose escalation study, and you can see viral loads there's a dose-related effect at lowering viral load. Um, up, 
you get uh, up to a two log drop in, in, in HIV RNA, which is good as any drug that's out there. So this is a highly active drug. It is now going through the steps that ibilizumab went in terms of treating multiple drug resistant virus. It's also being studied for maintenance of suppression. So the hot topic these days is BNABs, broadly neutralizing antibodies. So I thought I'd spend a little time with that because that's, at least in the NIH, it, this is very, uh, very highly uh, studied group of drugs now. And, and the, the, the reason is that there's new technology has allowed the ability to do single ge genome sequencing and cloning of genes in, of, of, of individual B cells so that um, uh, a whole new class of antibodies have been isolated from HIV-infected individuals that have much more potent activity than the neutralizing antibodies that were studied before. And they tend to bind at these, at these sites on the spike of the envelope of HIV. Um, now, to back up for a moment, I, I just want to remind you that HIV is very genetically diverse out there. Um, HIV, when it replicates, is very error prone. It mutates very readily with each replication event. And so out there you have multiple different strains of HIV. And in an individual person, HIV is constantly mutating so that you have this so-called quasi-species phenomenon in each infected individual where you have slightly different strains, so to speak, of HIV. In fact, it's not one virus. It's slightly different strains. So because of that, it's hard to develop a vaccine. It's been, you know that when you give one drug alone, the virus will mutate and develop resistance to it. And it's also a mechanism of how the virus evades the immune system, both the humor immunity and cell immunity, to evade it, mutate, and not be recognized anymore for immune attack. So this genetic diversity is very important in, in our discussion we're going to go forward with here. It turns out, um, so each of these sites they may be neutralizable sites, but they can change very readily. The sites that change less readily are what's seen in green and yellow here, the CD4 binding site and the so-called EMPER site, the EMPER part of GP41, which is close to where fusion occurs. And I mentioned that so you can recognize in the next slide, which shows all the antibodies we're talking about. And on this, on the x-axis, you see potency, and the y-axis, you see breadth of activity. In terms of potency, these are the new agents clearly more active than what we were interested in before. Um, this is a log scale. And in terms of breadth, you can see the yellows and the greens are somewhat are better. Uh, it's not like the, it's not like there can is, there is no variability at those sites, but for there to be a mutation there it's, it's more likely that a mutation could lead to a non-viable virus than it's so the other, at the other sites. So these tend to have more breadth um, than the others. But I, I point out that they're nowhere close to 100%. If you develop a small molecule drug against HIV, these drugs are active against almost everything they see, which is a different story that what, than what we're talking about with antibodies, which has a you know, not small number of isolates that are still going to remain resistant to these antibodies up front, let alone developing resistance later. Now, to remind you, in this life cycle of HIV, um, part of it is for the, you know, it's an RNA virus that makes DNA and then goes forward, so it's a retrovirus, right? And when it makes DNA, this DNA gets integrated into the host cell genome. That doesn't go away. When, when you suppress this life cycle with all the great drugs we have now, this remains in so-called so latent infection inside these cells, the so-called latent reservoir of HIV that doesn't go away despite suppression. So when you stop drugs, this, the DNA of the virus is still there in the cell it then can make new virus, and, and viremia returns. 
And these cells don't go away. They're, they're memory CD4, largely memory CD4 T lymphocytes, which um, have, are there for a long time. And if you think about it, these are the memory cells you want to be there for a long time. These are the memory cells that are remembering the vaccines you got as a kid of, of all the, of the infectious agents you've been exposed to uh, in your life that you want to have memory last for a long time. So these cells are designed, programmed to live a long time. And so they, even on antiretroviral therapy, they don't go away. And they remain as a so-called latent reservoir HIV, even in people on antiretroviral therapy. Now, some of the interest of the antibodies is not just in its antiviral effect, but could these antibodies be used to target these latently infected cells that are either spontaneously expressing HIV antigens periodically or somehow induced to express these antigens so that they could be targeted by the immune system? And could these antibodies be used to attack these cells and so-called achieve a, a cure or at least a sustained remission, potentially getting people off antiretroviral therapy? So I remind you of the structure of the antibodies, which is there's two arms that are basically the, the FAB arms that, it, that it bind to the, the antigen, and then there's the FC arm, which is really the functional arm of the antibody, which includes so-called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity and other activities that might target cells that are latently infected with HIV. Now, of the IgGs, you remember there's one, two, three, four from medical school. The IgG1 tends to have more of these FC activities um, that we're interested in, and so these neutralizing antibodies tend to be IgG1. The antibodies that we used for cell entry inhibition were IgG4, because we weren't interested in this uh, uh, immune activity. In fact, we wanted to avoid immune toxicity. So they tended to be IgG4. But even, even within that, you can create mutations and otherwise alter glycosylation patterns of these antibodies such that they might have better ADCC or other uh, cellular uh, engagement activities. I also want to point out that this part of the antibody is also the part that binds to the so-called neonatal uh, FC receptor, which is involved in mother-to-child transmission of antibodies and also in the pharmacokinetics of these antibodies, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So VRC01 is a Vaccine Research Center 01, NIH Vaccine Research Center uh, developed antibody, which targets the, the uh, CD4 binding site of HIV. And here's a study looking at its antiviral effect for maintenance of suppression. So in these studies, two different studies were presented in one paper. One was in the intramural program at the NIH. The other was an eight clinical trials group study in which um, antiretroviral therapy was stopped as these antibodies were delivered to see if they could maintain on their own viral suppression. Now, they used a, a historical control, which, I, which should not be used, and I'll show you why. But the historical control was people who stopped therapy on any other ACTG trials in the past, and that's the curve shown here of how fast it took for virus to return. And they, they looked at what the return rate was in people who got these antibodies. They didn't screen for, for antibody sensitivity up front, by the way. And here you can see that they argued that their results were that there was delayed rebound of virus uh, in both studies compared to the his historical control. Now, what you see in individual patients is they, they all rebounded at some point. Some of them, when you look retrospectively, did single genome analysis you could see that some of them were resistant from the beginning and some of them developed resistance on it. But almost universally, with a single antibody, resistance developed. Are two antibodies better than one? This was a study of another CD4 binding site antibody and a V3 loop antibody. Um, and again, compared to that same historical control, 
um, the combination of the antibodies gave even more prolonged delay of rebound of the, of the virus, uh, and even more delayed compared to one of the antibodies by itself looked at in a previous trial. Now, this study did screen up front for neutralization uh, acti activity of these antibodies against the patient's virus on a population basis, and looking at the whole group of viruses as a whole. But, it, it, but there were patients who relapsed early, whose rebound was early, and these patients, um, when they looked back at single genome analysis, they did find that there was virus that was resistant up front. But this is very high-tech techniques, and it points to the difficulty of knowing up front what, whether there's resistance going to be there early on. Now, to, to address that, the point I raised about could there be activities beyond antiviral activity? Could these antibodies engage the immune system to achieve more prolonged control of iremia? And they reported that two of these patients on this study um, did have delayed, had, had uh, prolonged suppression of virus long after the antibodies disappeared, shown in blue and red here. That, in fact, the, in the black is, is viral load, and these, there's long-term suppression on these patients. But I, sh I want to point out that um, these patients were started antiretroviral therapy shortly after they were infected in the first place, within about six months, you can see both of them. That makes them unique from the other patients in this study. And why is that important? And it gets to the point of controls. Here's an NIH study of a therapeutic vaccine regimen in people who were started, again, within six months of being infected on antiretroviral therapy. They were given these vac the vaccine regimen and then a so-called analytical treatment interruption where, where the medicines were stopped and see what, whether the, an, a better immune system was induced, a better immune response against HIV. And the way the curves look like in these analytical treatment interruptions is when you stop treatment, after about a couple of weeks, the virus is a steep slope up of viral load which then stabilizes and comes down presumably as the immune system is kicking in and trying to control the virus and settles at a new viral load set point. Now, in this study, if, you, if this was an uncontrolled study, and this was a randomized placebo-controlled study, but if this was an uncontrolled study, they, they found that 25% of patients ended up with viral loads below 400, which was what they considered success of viral suppression for extended period of time. I mean, this would have been in New England Journal of Medicine. It would have been in New York Times. You know, like a quarter of patients responded to this vaccine if it was an uncontrolled study. But if you look at placebos, they also had 25% response rates. Because when you treat people early, we've learned that there are some so-called post-treatment controllers who spontaneously do control their virus um, if treated early enough. It's a small fraction, but they're there and they're real. And so this vaccine really did nothing in terms of improving that rate. If it had not been a controlled study, concurrent controls, there would have been a totally misleading conclusion from the study. But sort of relevant to this issue of can these antibodies engage other cells to control, the immu other immune cells to control the infection, here's a monkey study with so-called SHIV. SHIV is SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, comparable to HIV, that has HIV sort of an HIV envelope engineered onto it. So and that's the model that's been used to study um, HIV in monkeys. This was a study where these, the same two antibodies were given within days of, being, of these monkeys getting infected. Now, that's um, not, not what we see in real life clinically, right? But still, um, there were not, the, these are not all the monkeys, but some of the monkeys ended up doing the same thing, controlling their virus off, uh, off, uh, off, uh, off anything uh, persistently. And it turned out when you gave, when they gave an anti-CD4 antibody to these 
monkeys. Um, there was a blip up of the viral load. The virus reappeared. And then when the antibody wore off and the CD4 cells returned, back down the virus went. So this argued well. The, the antibodies looked like they did engage uh, CD8 cells to control, better control the virus and uh, sort of supported this whole concept um, that was suggested by the clinical study as well. Similarly, there's another shift study where an immune activator, uh, a TLR7 agonist, both with the concept of both inducing expression of HIV from these lately infected cells to sort of prone them uh, to attack by the immune system and also um, to improve the immune response, to activate the immune response better when the virus does reappear on these cells. Given together with one of these antibodies, the V3 loop antibody, again, shortly after SHIV infection of these monkeys, did lead in combination to, in, in half of them to persistent suppression of virus uh, beyond the time of administration of both of these products compared to either a lone or a control group. And um, it turns out when you gave, then took the blood from these monkeys at this point and, and gave it to new monkeys that were not infected, the new monkeys didn't get infected. So again, this argued for maybe these antibodies are doing something to induce better immune responses to c control and perhaps even eliminate some of these latently infected cells. I mentioned about mother-to-child transmission. So these, this FC uh, neonatal receptor um, in animal, in rodents, this, this happens during breastfeeding where the antibodies IgG binds to the receptor and is taken up by endosomes and then transmitted across into the neonatal uh, um, circulation. In humans, most antibody transport occurs in utero. Um, antibodies are taken up into endosomes of cells and then transmitted to the fetal circulation across the placenta. That's where it happens mostly in humans. After birth, Antibodies, again, can be taken up by endosomes and uh, unbound to um, the FC neonatal receptor. And then if they are bound to the receptor, they can be brought back to the surface and brought back to the circulation and persist in, uh, in a prolonged manner. If they're not bound to the receptor, they then get transmitted to lysosomes unbound and they get degraded. So this is a way of eliminating antibodies in, this, in your body. Now I mentioned being able to, to put mutations into the FC component of the antibody. It turns out if you change two amino acids on that FC component of the antibody, you can, imp you can increase the affinity of that antibody to the FC neonatal receptor. And by doing that, you can prolong its persistence in circulation. And here's an example of that same VRCO1 antibody, and here's its pharmacokinetics. But you can prolong its half-life with these mutations, both in the VRCO1 and VRCO7. This is six months. This antibody could be around for six months or longer. And it, not only would this be very useful in treatment, but you can see its benefit potentially in prevention if, if it was active. Speaking of prevention, um, even with the earliest, earlier generation of, uh, of uh, ant neutralizing antibodies against HIV, you could demonstrate in a SHIV model compared to not doing anything and them all getting infected uh, you can see that either one of these antibodies protected against infection. It turns out you have to give very high doses of these antibodies. And in a meta-analysis of all, even the more recent, more potent antibodies, you need very high titers, neutralization titers of antibodies to prevent infection when challenged. 
um, by a shiv, at least in the animal model. But you got, but on the other side, you have to think these are shivs where you know that the antibody that are you know that shiv is sensitive to this antibody. Out there, I talked, I talked to you, I mentioned that out there, HIV is very heterogeneous, and there are going to be strains out there that are not going to be sensitive to the antibody you're thinking about. So there's that, and there's the fact that we know from the past that, you know, human infection is different. The conditions of getting tr the dose of virus that you get, the mucosa is different. Every, just a lot of aspects of the actual infectious event are different than what happens in monkeys. And we know from the past that monkey experiments have not always translated into human success stories. Um, so in conclusion, I'll just say that we know that the combination of small molecule nanoparticle suspensions has demonstrated acceptable clinical activity and patient acceptance is good in, in virally suppressed individuals. The various issues associated with the long-term presence of drugs will be more completely addressed as we gather more experience. I think we're still in the early stages of learning how to use these drugs. Um, I think the potential role of these therapies in otherwise difficult to treat patient populations is, is critical and needs further study. Um, the broadly neutralizing antibodies have demonstrated clinical antiviral activity, but viral resistance both at baseline induced is a bigger issue than with small molecules. Uh, contr more controlled mechanistic studies are needed to determine the potential of these antibodies to reduce the so-called latent reservoir to achieve sustained virologic control off antiretroviral therapy. And prevention studies both with small molecules and BNABs are underway. Um, I'll just uh, dedicate this talk to uh, this little guy who recently uh, seen in his uh, satellite view um, uh, who recently entered this world and conferred upon me a new title, Grandfather. <laughs> and I, I, was also, I was also asked to advertise this event that's going to uh, talk about how wonderful it is to be an infectious disease physician. Um, and uh, certainly uh, I can vouch for, uh, uh, you know, the, the, having lived through the AIDS epidemic from beginning to end is sort of one example of just sort of uh, how incredibly challenging and rewarding it can be. And this event is free and comes with food and drink. <laughs> so thanks so much. So how often do patients get these, like, DUPO forms or long-acting forms, or how, how often are they implanted or injected or... Administered, yeah. yeah. So the the current two drug regimen that was studied will, will be out there monthly for monthly uh, injections. Um, the antibodies in their long acting form um, are being studied uh, in, in even longer intervals, uh, at least three months, perhaps even six months and longer. Okay. Can you question about the long-acting antiretrovirals. Usually when we start patients on oral therapy for treatment and continue to pressure for three drug patients, with the injectable cyst and integrated uh, gravity wiring, what are your thoughts on C versus 2 when the current principle is to use three drugs at all times? For the antibodies? Uh, for the antiretroviral medication. For the drugs. Yeah, I mean, I think because of that, that's why it's been studied primarily for maintenance. I think the, the developers of those drugs saw their path to getting approval and out there uh, not, uh, not being so uh, adventurous as to try to do it up front and get and achieve success. They saw the easiest path uh, and, and sort of from the surveys of patients sort of uh, being happy with it for main, maintaining their existence sort of as maintaining uh, suppression. So these are patients who are completely suppressed on a three-drug regimen and they switch to a two-drug regimen right. monthly. That's what they went to the FDA for approval for, and that's what they showed so-called non-inferiority on in, in their studies, and that's what they were hoping to see. So to answer your question, and, and there have been some studies before that with oral agents that showed that uh, to a great extent two drugs can be adequate for maintaining 
suppression once uh, someone is suppressed. Dr. Yeah. Rodriguez? Yeah, no, it's not. Um, just to add that exactly that is the paradigm is shifting, putting uh, the old scenarios and the old scenarios uh, maintenance of power suppression and uh, even in my age, um, there is a currently approved uh, combination of drugs that have been studied for to the study based system that's shown with non security. Two, two, two drug combinations. Because obviously the dogma for years and years is three, three, three. This is a new right. the, the continued evolution of HIV care, very right. rapid, yeah. Right. And um and this is a, the important concept to keep in mind is that um uh, even within two drugs, uh, those two drugs still target two different uh places in the life cycle of the virus, uh, which is exactly what we do with the three drugs. So it's really a matter of uh, how much activity we need in each of the two targets. We have two potent drugs. Um, that's the problem with this. Um, just point outside of the, um, of the approved indication for this, for these type of combinations of drugs, and for the two drug combination, the reality is that it's something that experienced patients have known for, for a number of years. Uh, I'm only speaking for myself, but certainly we have been doing dual functional, dual hormone, dual therapy for a very long time. And they do okay, essentially two effective yeah. drugs. Yeah. I think you have to be careful with people who start with very high viral loads, like, uh, you know, then, then, you know, uh, you know. Three. yeah, yeah. But awesome. Yes, I, well, I think, I think we're after one o'clock, and, and maybe you can just come down and ask a question. Which I want to thank you again for okay. the fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you.